to Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 133. For new viewers, Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And we've put together an interesting program for you with very contrasting guests. So our main interview is one that we did last year during our UK trip. I had the pleasure of interviewing James Laxton, who's the fourth generation owner of Laxton's Woolen Mill in Bradford, Yorkshire. So the UK textile industry took a big hit during the 90s with manufacturing moving to cheaper countries. And James joined his family business at the age of 21 in 1992. And at that time, there were around 150 woolen mills in Bradford alone. Now there's only a handful left. So during the 90s, Laxton's also went through very tough times with their employee count dropping from 600 to just three at one point. And then in the early 2000s, James was able to turn everything around by bringing back 100% of Laxton's manufacturing into the UK. And this was a really encouraging boost for the British wool industry. So James is highly knowledgeable about yarn and he's involved in some very innovative projects like creating high quality yarn from recycled fibers and thread waste. He's also working on producing a woolen rope to replace polypropylene ropes used in the fishing industry. Plus, he's a partner with Wool Keepers, which is an organization that gives sheep farmers a fair price for their wool and gives the end consumer full traceability on the wool products. So we're covering all of these topics and more during the interview, and I think you're going to find it a really fun, interesting learning experience. And we're going to Austin to meet our knitter of the world, Sarah Elizabeth Kellner. Sarah is the designer behind Rabbit Hole Knits and the recently published book, Wild and Woolly Knitted Animals. It's not just a book of patterns, it's called a naturalist's notebook and includes some scientific notes and drawings of the animals in their natural habitats. So Sarah worked on this book together with her son and daughter, so that makes it a family project. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why I'm dressed in a dandel, and you might have seen me wearing it in the last episode during the Swiss Yarn Festival. Well, as an Australian living in Germany, I do have a particular weakness for all the kitschy German paraphernalia, which includes cuckoo clocks, lederhosen and diendl. I just love them all. And for years now, I've been wanting to buy myself a diendl. So I was thrilled to find a small female run company in Munich that designs timelessly elegant diendls. The label's called Clara Dorothea and they use very high craftsmanship and their fabrics come from traditional weaving mills and family businesses here in Europe. So we're also including a short feature on these beautiful artisan-made diendels in our maker segment. But before we introduce you to these wonderful guests, Madeline and I are going to give you an update on our knitting projects in Bring and Brag. I finished my Good Grandpa cardigan, which is a design by Kadri. Even though it's a relatively quick and easy knit, I still managed to make some mistakes with it. Previously, mum's always checked each stage of my knitting to see that if I didn't make any mistakes, she'd see them early and could help me correct them. But this time I wanted to work independently and unfortunately I still made some mistakes. So the cardigan is knitted top down. You knit the body first and when that's finished, you pick up stitches around the armholes and knit the sleeves. I tried on the cardigan several times while I was knitting the body but found it difficult to know where the cardigan would hang on my shoulders. This is partly because it's oversized and also because I hadn't knitted the button band yet and the edges kept curling in. Um, so I just wasn't sure whether what I had knitted so far would fit me well or not and mum wasn't around to give me her advice either. But once I finished the sleeves and tried it on again, I noticed that it felt tight around the armholes and when I measured the circumference of the armholes, I realized that I had made a silly mistake to do with the gauge. So the recommended gauge is 16 stitches by 23 rows. Mine is 16 stitches by 25 rows. And that means that I have to add some rows to get the same length. And I had this in mind when it came to adjusting the length of the body or the torso, but it didn't register with me that I'd have to adjust the length of the armholes as well, of course. Um, and partly this was because I knitted that part in the car driving back from Switzerland. And to be honest, I was really focused on making progress that yes. I just completely <laughs> forgot about my row gauge. Yeah. Anyway, so 
this is where it actually would have come in handy to have the jumper constructed top near bottom up instead of top down. Yeah. So because this cardigan is knitted top down, um, if I did want to add length to the armholes, I would have to unpick both sleeves and the body, which you knit in one piece down here, up to the armholes. So that's most of my cardigan and I was quite upset by this thought. So I pulled mum in for advice. <laughs> And actually, yeah, even though it isn't an ideal fit because it does, the underarm here should be at least two centimetres deeper for a perfect fit. Mm. I still thought we could compensate by intensively blocking the garment between the shoulder seam and the underarm, which we did, and also by adding on some extra rows to the button band because if you make the button band just a little bit wider then the whole garment will hang off her shoulders just a little bit more mm. and that'll mean there'll be more room under the arms because this armhole seam here will sit just slightly lower. So we did that and I think it looks good and I also think that making the, bat uh, the button band wider fits really well with mm. this wide hem so yep. it still looks really balanced. Yeah. Both, like, all my ribbing is relatively long, so I think it looks good. Um, so the pattern recommends a yarn that is a blend of 65% merino, 20% alpaca, and 15% mohair. And the alpaca and mohair give the garment a lot of drape, which works very well for oversized designs like this cardigan is meant to be. I used Fleece and Harmony's signature Aran yarn in the colorway Autumn Verge, which I think is beautiful. Um, but this is 100% sheep's wool with a lot of crimp, and that means it has less, or my cardigan has less drape than the original design. Now the pattern recommends six millimeter needles for the body, sleeves, and pockets. Uh, but with this yarn, I got the correct stitch gauge, not row gauge, um, by going down to five millimeter needles. So I did that, and then when I was up to the ribbing on the body, I started off with 4.5 millimeter needles, but I didn't like how loose the ribbing looked, so I ripped that out and re knitted it using 3.75 millimeter needles instead. So that's quite a lot smaller than was recommended. Um, but I like the result, and I also used those needles on the cuffs, which made them a lot tighter than in the original design, but I like that as well. And I added four extra decreases along the lower part of the sleeve to make it slimmer. And I figured my sleeves would look better this way because, as I said before, my fabric is less drapey than the original design. Because this cardigan is so simple, you can get really creative with it if you want to. And I went to Ravelry to see what other knitters were doing with their versions, and quite a few put their own spin on it. So there was a lot of play with the pockets. Some people decided to leave out the pockets or only make one, and others changed the size and the placement of the pockets. You could even have a pocket up here, I guess. Yeah, you could. Yeah. Um, and some people played around with combining different colors, which I thought was cool too. So that I yeah. particularly liked one cream-colored variation that had a navy blue button band and edging, and also just two blue thin stripes on one sleeve to make it asymmetrical. And I thought that was a nice idea. That reminded me of a cricket cardigan. A cricket, oh yeah, yeah. true, yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm very happy with my own version, particularly after it was blocked. I think that made all the difference. And I think it looks good with jeans and a tight dress and maybe also skirts. And I'm just really thrilled that I finally got to use this yarn because I love the color and I've wanted to use it for a while now. I got it back last year when we were on Prince Edward Island. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope I'll get to wear this a lot. The weather in Germany is getting warmer and it's very warm during the day, but in the evenings, the temperatures still drop. So I'm hoping I get to wear this maybe in the next month or two in the evenings. Yeah, I think it went through a difficult stage, but it's turned out really, really well. Yeah. Whenever I look at it, I think it's it's really successful. Yeah, and the buttons are nice too. They're, they basically blend in with a cardigan. Yeah. But cool, well done. Thank you. So we're still in Bring and Brag because I've finished my summer top. Here it is. The design's called Joni, it's by Natasha Hornby who's Moonstruck Knits. I used a Danish yarn from the company Camarosa which is 100% linen. So here's a picture of the original modelled by the designer Natasha Hornby. The design is worked seamlessly from the top down and most of it's in stocking stitch with a fairly simple lace panel down the front. And Natasha writes that it's a modern interpretation of the quintessential vintage lace blouse. The top's designed to have approximately five to seven centimeters of positive ease. So I made my top fit tighter with five centimeters of negative ease. For new knitters, negative ease means that the final measurements of your garment 
will be smaller than your body's measurements. However, the fabric stretch of the garment will still allow for ease and movement. Now, I did want my top to fit tighter than what the pattern suggested, but I didn't intend for it to have quite so much negative ease. And it all happened because I knitted my stocking stitch swatch flat, so knitting and purling, whereas the garment is knitted in the round and the stocking stitch sections uh, have no purling in them. So, and, and the tension of my purl rows is just slightly looser than the tension of my knit rows, which is often the case for, for most people. It's only a slight difference. And so if any swatch that you do flat with every second row being purled is going to be slightly looser than one done in the round. And just to point out how much of a significant difference this can make, my gauge was 21 stitches for 10 centimeters when worked flat with every second row being purled and 24 stitches to 10 centimeters when done in the round. And as a result, the chest measurements for this top ended up being 10 centimetres smaller in the total circumference, changing it from having five centimetres of positive ease to five centimetres of negative ease. <laughs> um, why did you not simply make a swatch in the round? Because sometimes I do like to cut corners a little bit. And if you were going to do a stocking stitch uh, swatch in the round, you would have to add on extra stitches to make it more comfortable to knit it in the round because you're either working on DPNs and changing all the time or mm. doing magic loop and it's just more annoying. So what I should have done is just realise that if, if my gauge was really perfect with pearl rows that I probably should have gone up a quarter of a needle size to make it perfect without pearl, pearl rows mm. in the stocking stitch. But I was a little bit lazy but it's really worth pointing out that um, this can happen to you. Despite all of this though, I'm actually thrilled with the way it turned out because I think the design looks just as good as a tight fitting top. And you're gonna see that in a moment because I filmed Madeline modeling it and she's got the same chest measurements as me. <laughs> I wanted to show you some close up details of the design that I find particularly appealing. The main body is knitted in stocking stitch with a pearl row every 10 rows forming a little ridge. And the shoulders are shaped with short rows and the pearl ridges beautifully highlight the shaping. The little capped sleeves are knitted in garter stitch and also using short rows, so they're wider at the top of the shoulders than under the arms. And for a snugger fit, I added a few extra short rows to the cap sleeves, and then I bound them off more tightly to prevent them from sticking out at right angles to my shoulders. Also, I really like the hem, which dips at the front and the back. And again, the pearl ridges enhance the short row shaping, making it a more prominent design feature. And the lace panel down the front may seem complex, but it's actually a really straightforward lace pattern because it only uses two different lace patterns. The rest are just twisted stitches. So I think it is a really lovely little summer top that would suit many different body types because you don't have to put in the waist shaping and you could also knit it very oversized, like a loose summer blouse, mm. just as long as you kept the gauge very loose if you're using linen. To make it drapey, right? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yes, it's very pretty. I'm very <laughs> happy with it. So coming up next is our fashion shoot with Madeline modelling the Good Grandpa cardigan and the Joni summer top. And then we take you to Texas to meet our knit of the world. admit you love me and so how am I ever to know you always tell me perhaps 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 a million times I've asked you and then I ask you over again you only answer Say yes, 
But if you don't, dear, confess And please don't tell me Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps Sarah Elizabeth Kellner. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I'm the knitted toy designer behind Rabbit Hole Knits. Just to give you a little bit of history about my knitting, I learned to knit in the fourth grade, and loved it so much that I took my projects to school with me every day and taught my friends how to knit during recess. After a few years though, like a lot of people, I put it aside and didn't put it, pick it back up again until I was in my 40s. And at that time, I knit scarves and hats and mittens and all the normal things. Never dreamed I would ever knit a toy until my grandchildren were born. One day, I wanted to knit one of them a toy, but I couldn't find a pattern that looked like what I wanted to do. And so in the end, I decided to design one. And after that, I never wanted to knit anything but toys. And I never wanted to stop designing. I love the entire process. If someone were to ask me what my design style was, I would probably have to characterize it in one of two ways. I either like to knit animals that look very realistic or knit a toy that looks like it came from classic children's literature. I love the illustrations in those old fairy tales and storybooks, and that love has stayed with me today. The most important thing when I'm designing is to try and create it in one piece or in as few pieces as possible because I don't like to seam a lot of pieces together at the end and I imagine that a lot of you don't either. There's also something just very special about seeing an animal come alive in your hands and when you make it in one piece, it's just like magic. Okay, I thought I would show you four of my earlier designs. This one is called Henry's Rabbit. And it was actually one of my very first ones. And while I was designing it, I began a technique, which I still use today. And that is casting on stitches at the neckline and working the body in one piece going backwards all the way through his tail. Then I come back and pick up stitches in the, in the cast on stitches and work the head. Henry's Rabbit does have a few little pieces that are knit separately in the round and then seamed on after. That's his legs and ears. This one is called Goodnight Moon, and it's always been one of my favorites. It was a bit of a challenge to work through this pattern, but in the end, I came up with a, a formula of short rows and regular knit rows, and you use it from beginning to end. So it's, it's pretty fun, and I think it exemplifies what I was talking about earlier with the children's literature. The stitches were cast on here under the hat, work all the way through the end, and then picked up stitches to, to work his hat. A little bit of embroidery can customize it for the knitter. This fellow is called Forest Gnome. He's worked a little bit differently than the others. I still cast on at the neckline, 
but his body is made all in one piece with raglan shaping, similar to how you would make a top-down sweater. So it, it's made with the arms, the breeches, the legs, and the shoes all in one piece. His coat is worked separately. It was made flat on straight needles. The head and hat are worked in the round and then seamed together at the neck. The beard and hair are added last. That's Forrest Gnome. And some of you may recognize this character. He's Hedwig from the Harry Potter movies. My friend Tannis Gray was writing the book of Harry Potter knitting patterns, and she asked me if I would design a toy for her book. And so I immediately thought of Hedwig because he's just he's similar to my style. Stitches were cast on here at the neck again. His whole body is made in one piece, including the legs and little tail feathers there. Then I went back and picked up stitches, made his head as a tube, and then folded it over on the top to get this shape. The wings were knit flat on straight needles. Each wing is in two pieces. The bottom part has a ribbing pattern, and each of the sections has a little scalloped edge. So I'm really excited to show you about my latest project. It's a book called Wild and Wooly Knitted Animals, a Naturalist Notebook, and it was released in October of 2022. It's more than just a knitting book. It's got 25 animal patterns in it, but along with each pattern is a corresponding naturalist page, and that's why it's called a naturalist notebook. So the naturalist pages look like this. They're filled with illustrations and sketches of each animal, along with handwritten scientific facts and little interesting tidbits. My son did the illustrations and my daughter did the handwriting and layout of these pages. So it was a family project and something I'm really proud of. This is the flatback sea turtle. And here is a western meadowlark. It's more than just a knitting book, as I said. I think it's, it's really special and I'm very proud. This is uh, one of the animals from the book. It's an eastern cottontail rabbit. And I love it because he's in running position. Stitches were cast on at his neck. The chest is worked flat, and then the stitches are divided for each leg, picked up here again, and then his whole body is worked in one piece, including the legs and tail. Then you come back to the cast on stitches and pick up enough to do the ears and the head. This is called Common Raccoon. He's made a little bit differently than most of my animals. The work begins here at the bottom of one leg, goes up to the center, and then the other leg is worked, and then they're joined at the top. After that, stitches are picked up behind his legs, and then the whole body is worked all the way through the tail. Stitches are picked up for the head, knit in the round, and there's a little bit of intarsia here for the black and white section. At the end, his nose is embroidered, and two little ears are sewn on top. This one is called Rainbow Trout, and he is knit differently than my others. He's one of my few designs that is knit flat in two pieces. So the top piece is the green and salmon colored, and the bottom piece is the white. After both of those sections are done, the stitches are joined to knit the tail fins. Then the two pieces are seamed together along the edges, and embroidery makes the spots. Here is North American River Otter. His chest was also made flat, but it uses intarsia method of color work to get the white in the center and brown on each side. So I cast on here, knit his chest flat, then divided the stitches, joined them in the round for the legs. Stitches are picked up here to knit the body all the way through the end of the tail and picked up here to make the head, which also uses intarsia. That's my latest project I've been excited to talk to everyone about. And um, I would like to let you know I'm working on a new book now. I can't share with you what it's about, but I'm very excited. I know a lot of you are going to love it, and it'll be released in the fall of 2024. 
Thanks so much for watching today. And thank you, Andrea, for letting me be on your show. Welcome back. So Sarah sent us her book, Wild and Woolly Knitted Animals, and we had a lot of fun looking through all the different patterns and learning interesting tidbits about the different animals. Yeah, and I really like the concept of this book. I think the handwriting and the drawings add a very special touch to it. The book has 25 patterns in it, and Sarah just showed you some of them. It also has a wood pigeon, which I think is my favorite. Because in Germany, many people call pigeons the rats of the sky because they, at least in the city centers, can carry quite a bit of disease and be a bit dirty. But I've always been quite fond of pigeons, especially the wood pigeon, so I was delighted to find one in Sarah's book. She did such a good job of capturing its features and colors. Now the dusty pink chest and the two white circles around its neck are done with intarsia and it has a distinctive patch of shimmering green above the circles, and this is done with very easy embroidery stitches. The recommended yarn for this pattern is Cascade 220. I think all the designs actually use Cascade yarn. Yeah, I think so. Um, but from the sketch introducing the pigeon, I learned that they have this muscular sack in their chest <laughs> called a crop, which they use to store food. It's a bit like our little cupboard. Um, and this crop sack can also produce a fluid similar to milk to feed their babies. And only a few other birds can do this. So in my eyes, this makes pigeons even cooler. <laughs> Actually, growing up, my family kept homing pigeons and we would have to mm. exercise them daily by releasing them from their aviary and then we'd throw a tin can filled with stones up into the air and the noise of this tin can would make the pigeons fly up and then they'd fly in a circle around our house and we had to keep throwing the tin can with stones high into the air to make the pigeons fly higher and higher. And it was one of my after school tasks every day was to make these pigeons exercise for 20 minutes. So I had to throw this tin can into the <laughs> air as high as I could for 20 minutes, which is kind of fine for the first five minutes. It gets a little bit tedious after that. Yeah. And then on the weekends, we would actually drive them about 100 kilometers away and release them. And they would always arrive home before we did, which I found quite fascinating. But I suppose we weren't really driving at crazy speeds like you do here on the German Autobahn. <laughs> did you did you actually watch them have babies as well? Like, did you yeah, see them feed? Yeah, yeah. What does it look like? Well, I think it changes. I think it, it starts off as a milky kind mm -hmm. of fluid and then as the chicks get bigger, it looks a little bit more like porridge. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to ruin that, anyone's breakfast. <laughs> not that you you see it that much, but okay. you, you can sort of see them kind yeah, of regurgitating yeah. it up and the, and yeah. the chicks oh. like this all the time. <laughs> so it was quite fun. Maybe we yeah. do need to knit a wood pigeon. And Sarah is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 50% discount off all her self-published patterns from her Ravelry store. She has 67 designs to choose from. I think my personal favourites are the scullery cat and the mice because I think they'd look really great sitting together in the corner of your kitchen. So have a lot of fun browsing through her store and thank you very much to Sarah. So we'd like to remind you that fruity knitting is only possible to produce through the financial support of our patrons and it is really inexpensive to become a patron. You can do so by making a small, regular monthly contribution, and that means that we can continue to produce the show. So if you are watching, please do support our work by becoming a patron, and thank you to the wonderful viewers who have done that. Yep, thank you very much for your support. <laughs> Oh,
So we've driven down to Munich in Bavaria and I'm with Clara Kroschiel, who is the founder of the fashion label Clara Dorothea. Many people associate Munich with Oktoberfest, where the men wear lederhosen, the women dress up in Diendl, and everyone consumes large quantities of beer. Now, in German-speaking countries, lederhosen and Diendl are referred to as Tracht, and here in Bavaria, Tracht is also worn on special occasions, like weddings and baptisms and parties, so not only for beer festivals. And these traditional costumes can sometimes look very colourful and with lots of embellishments and also a little bit kitsch. But the fashion label Clara Dorothea is offering a more subtle and chic handmade alternative. So Clara, how common is it to own and wear a Diendl or Lederhosen here in Germany? And can you tell us a little bit more about where people typically wear them? Well, that depends a lot on where you're from in Germany. So if you're from the north, you'll probably not own one. If you're from the south, so either Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg, so mostly the Alpine regions, you'll wear one and you'll have one in your closet. Um, and here it's worn for christenings and weddings and family celebrations and, of course, the folk festivals, the biggest of them being the Oktoberfest. Um, and But it's only been quite a recent trend that actually even young people like to wear their Tracht out and about and celebrate their birthdays in Tracht and go to the Oktoberfest in Tracht. That's only been a trend for, say, 15 to 20 years. Um, when my parents-in-law used to go to the Oktoberfest in the 80s, they'd go in jeans and T-shirts. So it's been quite a change from that. So now, maybe even if you're from Hamburg, you have a nice dundle in your closet to uh, wear to the Oktoberfest when you come to Munich in October. Okay, okay. So can you tell us something about traditional Trachten, in particular the female costume? So how were they worn and how have they changed over the years? Well, there's two different types of Tracht. So what we are wearing now is actually not really traditional Tracht because it is, was sort of invented by city people going to the countryside in the 1900s to sort of breathe some fresh air, come into the countryside. They'd see the women working in the fields in their undergarments, essentially, because it was hot, and they'd take off their jackets. And they were wearing this corset and skirt combination. And they would, so the city people would sort of romanticize that and make some pretty summery light linen versions of that. And that was, that is what sometime, uh, somehow became the tracht that we are wearing now and okay. what's been worn now as tracht by everyone. But um, in Bavaria and Austria as well, you have a different type of tracht which is specific to the region and the area that you come from and can change from hamlet to hamlet. And it, um, it shows exactly who you are, where you're from. It shows your social status very clearly, depending on what color you wear, where you tie your hair, what sort of shawl you wear. So it's, you can't choose what you wear or what color you wear. It's all prescribed in a way. Um, and it's really, really specific to the area that you come from, but it's different. So this is different from that traditional. Okay. Tract. And even how you tie the apron is, shows your marital status. Yes. That's one element that this sort of modern tract does have. So you tie your apron on the right if you're married, on the left if you're single, and in the back of your widow or if you're catering. Okay. <laughs> Now, your fashion label, Clara Dorothea, started after you searched unsuccessfully for a Diendl and then ended up designing your own. Now, you've studied fashion design and you've also worked at various fashion houses, so you obviously had the skills to design and make your own Diendl, but what were you looking for in a Diendl that you couldn't find anywhere else? Well, at the time, I was sort of in the middle of my fashion design course um, and I was invited to the Oktoberfest. I didn't have a Diendl yet. Um, and everything I was looking at was at a, either way out of my budget or just sort of not up to my design standards. Um, cheaper dirndl tend to, not always, but tend to have quite flashy colors. Often you have to, a lot of polyester is used and I just yeah. didn't find anything that I liked. So what I specifically like about the traditional shape is that you have beautiful materials and beautiful colors. So I made one like that and I kept being asked about it and that sort of slowly developed into a collection when I started making one for friends and friends of friends and yeah well here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so what parts of the traditional costume do you think are really important to hold on to and what parts are you modernizing? Well the most important part I think is the silhouette that you create. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially we're now both wearing a corset not something yet that you would typically be wearing for every day now and it gives you a beautiful shape. So a well-fitted corset top that's sits really well on the body is important, I think. And then you have the skirt as a counterpart and that needs to be full and needs to have volume. So you actually 
can concentrate on showing your waistline, yeah, yeah. the slim part in the middle. Yeah. So, and that only works if you have this sort of shape and then you can never leave the house without an apron. So these three parts are definitely essential. And then also some people tend to leave the blouse out every now and then. It's not a style I like. So I think the classic white blouse, a different color can also sometimes work, but with the classic shape of a slim, beautifully made corset top and a white skirt is what is really essential to a beautiful dirndl. Do you sometimes wear petticoats or anything underneath it? Is that typical? Um, that depends. People do. Um, I don't particularly like it because if you use a lot of material in the skirt anyway, then it gives you enough volume to move. Yeah. But for, as I said earlier, those traditional trachten from, from the countryside, they do have several layers of skirts underneath. Um, but these are sort of, they were worn in summer, so you wouldn't want loads and loads of layers underneath so no for these not normally no okay. only if you're overstyled. Now while we've been talking here Madeline has been trying on lots of Dienden and I'm sure she's having a great time so let's go over and see what she's wearing and you can talk about your collection mm -hmm. and the materials you use and the craftsmanship involved. Yes. Okay, so what Madeline's wearing now is one of our most classic cuts. We actually have a Queen Anne neckline with these edges in the front because we think that's just the shape that works best on most body types of women. And um, for Tracht, that's actually called a Salzburg cut. So these inserted little triangles and uh, this shape is originally from Salzburg. Um, we always work with pipe buttonholes. They're all handmade, so I just think those are the most beautiful uh, buttonholes. Sometimes we even uh, change the fabric of the buttonholes and then around the neckline here we have an inserted grow grain ribbon to give it some more stability. And in general for the whole corset top that's what's very important to me is that you have quite a sturdy, quite a strong fabric with quite uh, a lot of lining. So you have shape and you have form and you have stability and that's also why we have some inserted boning here and here to give that corseted shape without it being uncomfortable. So if the dundle has been fit well to your body type, it should sit really well and give you structure and shape. Um, and then where the top hits the bottom, sort of the where the skirt is added, we have um, pleats in the front and in the back um, it's creased. So you have more volume in the skirt in the back than in the front where you tie your apron on. Uh, this material is very beautiful. It's from, it's woven in Austria, in Vienna. Um, it's a cotton mix and you have this very subtle flower band pattern. It's technically a classic Tracht uh, material, but not so classic. So we like to mix it up always, not use these super traditional materials or and colors and prints at the same time. So only pick one. Like this, for example, this linen is the most classic material for Tracht, but the color is a bit special. So now when you tie your apron, what's important is that it sits exactly here where the skirt begins. And then it's also important to tie it quite tightly before you make the bow, because otherwise you will never get it to sit right and um, in the right spot. But if the journal's been fit to you well, then this should be exactly in your waistline, so it shouldn't be moving up or down anyway. So this is one of our news collection items, the style is called Claire and it's made from this beautiful brocade fabric. It's also from a Viennese company and it's made from a linen, polyester and silk mix and has this beautiful pattern. Um, we have these big bows that are sort of Renaissance inspired, detail from the new collection and inspired by how um, corsets used to be tied either here at the top or sometimes here at the sides as well. But this is purely ornamental for us now. Um, the buttons that are here, they are is sort of gunmetal grey and they're made by a company in Austria that have been making buttons for 150 years, so they really know what they're doing. And then here for the skirt, um, we have a beautiful Irish linen. It's woven with two different colours of yarn. So you have the subtle colour variations. It has a very nice, heavy feel to it. And then we have a pleating down here to just give it more structure. It flows really beautifully when you move. And then here we have a pure silk. Uh, with uh, yeah, a woven um, dot. And the cool thing about our dolls is that usually when you take your apron off and you put a different one on in another color, it completely changes up your outfit. So as you can see, this is a completely new look, so it's very fun to be able to play with your look in this way. We're changing either your apron or your blouse.
What Madeline is wearing now is another new collection item and we focus a lot on sustainability. So this fabric here is a dead stock fabric from an Italian high fashion house. It's a beautiful cotton and wool boucle. It has a lot of structure and here underneath in the front, in the underneath the boning, you can see the hooks and eyes it's closed with. So they're very big and um, it's a very traditional way of closing up your journal. So we only ever use buttons or hooks and eyes, never zippers. That's very, uh, well, let's not say trashy, but yeah. Um, and this blouse is one of our best sellers. It has a V-shaped neckline that's inspired by the neckerchiefs that women used to wear around their um, uh, necks and sort of tuck them in into their corsets in the front. Um, and it has this beautiful short sleeve. And just to show you what journal blouses look, like um, without a corset on top. They're quite short, so they're cut underneath here. So underneath the tight corset, you don't have as much fabric. And this lace is also very beautiful. It's from a company that also made the lace for Kate Middleton's wedding dress. So they really know what they're doing. So if you want to wear something over your dundle, you can go some with something like this. It's um, our, it's called Yanker. And the important thing I think is that you have something that's very tailored to your waistline because you don't want to destroy that beautiful figure you've created, which is why we've added this little peplum here in the back with the little pleats uh, to give you a very nice uh, waist-centered shape. Um, and you can also wear a very short uh, cardigan that sort of ends in the waistline just to always accentuate that beautiful figure that you've created with the corset. I thought Madeline looked great in a dindle, particularly the green one. And I have to say, I am really enjoying wearing this one. What is this colourway called? Well, we call it ocean blue because of the mix of the greens and the blues it has. Yeah, it's very beautiful. And it's surprisingly comfortable for a corset. And you definitely feel very feminine. <laughs> yeah, <you do. laughs> I think it's going to be difficult for me not to walk out of here wearing this gorgeous one. But what are your ideas about what can or can't be worn with Tracht? For example, during Oktoberfest or on a special occasion, what accessories would complement the costume but, not, but still look individual? Well, go with some jewellery that you would otherwise also like, something that complements the colour of your donut perhaps, but then something very traditional would be a Kopfband like you're wearing now. Um, in English, that would be a choker. It's a very traditional piece, but um, otherwise, I'm always a fan of you wearing something that you'd otherwise also wear, so you don't only have it for that one occasion, which is always sad if you only get it out once a year. Um, and then it's nice to um, maybe have a bag that suits, and shoes, I think, are very important because uh, usually when you wear a journal, you wear it for an occasion, so you want something that's comfortable uh, and elegant at the same time, so I'm not a fan of wearing Ch uh, chucks or boots too much uh, and not too high heel shoes because your feet will hurt so these are quite a perfect uh, mix of the two because they're flat and they're comfortable but they're still out and they, they are a fantastic match with this outfit yeah, they are <laughs> <laughs> okay and jewelry we've got something here for the hair uh, yeah, those are sort of dried handmade flower combs that we have. We sell them during Oktoberfest season and people also like to wear them for weddings or christenings to accessorize the hair. And then we also sometimes have some handmade uh, wristbands out of the flowers. Those are nice because you can always uh, pick the flowers to match your dundle and it's sort of a nice uh, natural addition to the whole look. Okay, so what are some real don'ts? Well, for me personally, like I said, wearing chucks with your journals is something that I just don't think works. Um, and then black off-shoulder blouses are a big no-no for me. I like the white blouse because it gives you so much freshness and it allows you to wear much color that otherwise wouldn't work on you, maybe, yeah. if you wore it directly on your skin. So uh, it's just nice to have that white, uh, yeah, a speck of white on your outfit. And also the added bonus is that you can wash your blouse most journals cannot be uh, machine washed, so it's nice to be able to mix and match your blouse and your apron and sort of change up your outfit, so don't leave your blouse at home, even if you think it looks sexier. It might, but it's just but I think much these, more elegant. I think they also look a little <laughs> bit sexy. <laughs> yeah, they can, depending on how much you close up um, yeah. the buttons yeah. or leave open. So, so even though this um, cleavage here on the actual bodice is quite low, a lot of your blouses are quite high. They're quite they? high up, yeah. yeah, because we have we have clients who want to show a bit of cleavage, but most don't. They want to have the opportunity off, so you can you know, like I have leave the buttons open, but you don't want to show show that sort of full uh, yeah. cleavage and display <laughs> everything. Uh, so mostly, yeah, we have uh, higher necklines, and I just think it gives it a much more elegant uh, okay. feel. It's my birthday coming up soon, so I might just treat myself. <laughs> 
It's been so much fun to have you on Fruity Knitting. So thank you so much for giving us your time. Yes, thank you so much for coming down and talking to me. It's been fun. Thanks. Good. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed meeting the designer behind Clara Dorothea. I've been sitting here without wearing my beautiful salmon coloured apron, which does add a lot of colour and style to the costume. But the apron rustles and I was concerned that our audio equipment will pick up on the noise and amplify it. But now it's nearly time for Madeline and I to say goodbye. So I'm going to sit here very neatly and still and, and not move my hands and hopefully it'll stay quiet. <laughs> You look like little Miss Muffet. Yes. Actually, I do feel like I've come out of a storybook or Anne of, or um, Alice in Wonderland, I also feel. That's true, yeah. yeah, if you were wearing blue. Yeah. But, yes, little Miss Muffet who sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey and along came a, a spider, spider who sat, sat down, down beside, beside her, her frightening Miss Muffet away. Yeah. <laughs> I hate spiders. So I'm very thrilled to be living in Germany because of that <laughs> as an Australian. Okay, so as you can imagine, I really want to get a lot of wear out of this dirndl. So I do need to get out more and I think in the summer months I should go to some beer festivals. The problem is that I, I'm more of a wine drinker than a beer drinker. But Germany does have better um, beers than Australians. Sorry, Absolutely. Australians. <laughs> so maybe I can develop a taste for it. Yeah, so we're nearly up to our interview with uh, James Laxton. But first I wanted to tell you about the Wool Keepers Initiative, which is making positive changes within the UK wool industry. So Wool Keepers is an organisation that keeps track of where the wool comes from in the UK and checks that the animals are treated well on those farms. And they also want to ensure that farmers get a fair price for their wool. And they do this by working together with sheep farmers and manufacturers like Laxtons who turn the wool into a finished product. The participating sheep farmers focus on good animal husbandry, using as little antibiotics as necessary, and also, of course, keeping the land healthy to foster local biodiversity. So I think it's a good organisation. Um, and each batch of wool has an identification number that shows you which farm it came from and where it went to be processed into a finished product. So the end consumer can then trace down um, their purchase, whether it was a piece of some skeins of yarn or some clothing or some other wool product like bedding even, back to the farm that the wool came from. Yeah. And the Wool Keepers website shows how many farms have joined the initiative and how much traceable wool has been supplied so far. It also features some short but interesting articles that show um, farmers that talk about their lives on the farm and their personal views on good farming practices. And all in all, I think it's a very inspiring project. So I think a lot of you would be interested in it. Definitely. I think a lot of our viewers would find that very interesting. And Laxton's has recently launched a new yarn range in connection with Wool Keepers called Wool Trace. And as the name suggests, Wool Trace is a fully traceable yarn. And each skein will have a QR code on it that you, the customer can scan. And that'll bring up the website My Farm Finder which will show the sheep farm that the wool in the skein comes from, as well as the farm's biography. So Laxton's is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount of everything in their online shop, and that's including the two yarn ranges, Sheep Soft and Wool Trace. So James talks about Sheep Soft during the interview. It's 100% British wool yarn made from Blueface Leicester and Massam with a low carbon footprint because it's less than 50 miles from the fleece to the finished yarn. So Sheep Soft comes in a four ply, a DK and an Aran weight and in 16 heathered shades. And the new Wool Trace yarn also comes in 16 beautiful colours and that's available as a DK weight yarn. So thank you very much to Laxton's for offering a patron discount on these really interesting yarns. So it's time now for Madeline and I to say goodbye. Hope you really enjoy the interview. I think you're going to learn a lot and we'll see you really soon. Yeah, thank you for spending time with us.
Bye. Bye. to Fruity Knitting. I'm in Bradford sitting with the fourth generation British woolen mill owner James Laxton of Laxton Yarns. So Laxton's was founded in 1907 by James's great-grandfather George Laxton and the mill is best known for its worsted spun and fancy yarns and over the last 115 years or so it's had a lot of ups and downs and changes. Now 100% of the mill's manufacturing has been reshored back here in Yorkshire and this is a really encouraging story for the British wool industry. And James is really the one who's made that all happen. So I'm very happy to be here and hear you share the story of the mill on Fruity Knitting. So thank you for welcoming us. No, not at all. Thank you for coming. It's delightful to have you here. Good. So your customers come from all areas of the textile industry. Could you just start by giving us an overview of the different kinds of yarn that you produce and who your customers are? Yeah, we, we're, as you mentioned, fancy yarn uh, and worsted spinner, and we produce products for many different markets. Our main uh, fibre is wool. Uh, we use other fibres, um, uh, mohair, silk, alpacas, but it's all based on wool as the carrier or the main fiber. And the markets that we operate in are hand knitting. We would supply brands such as Rowan, West Wool, Sonder Yarns, uh, just to name but a few. We also operate in the machine knitting market where we will produce yarns for uh, ready to wear clothing, men's and ladies. So we would do uh, Toast, Fred Perry, um, and various other brands. The, uh, we also a, yeah. operate in the ladies' uh, apparel and men's apparel. Uh, that particular garment was for Jigsaw. Yeah. Um, and we'll produce yarns that go into other fabrics for the likes of Jack Wills, Chanel, uh, and various other high street brands. We also operate in the and sell yarns into the uh, woven upholstery market for contract and domestic. So we're talking about brands, Herman Miller, Cavadrat, Chimera, mainly on the contract side, but some of them uh, at the higher end go into the domestic um, designer brands. Coming back to hand knitting, do you also produce um, bases for hand dyers? Yes, yeah. we produce yarns for um, hand dyers all over the world. And they are made from, again, predominantly wool, uh, some will have different breeds in, some will have um, different natural fibres in. And you know, we ship hand-dyed yarns all over the world to the you know, brands Koyu, uh, Gould, Rivernitz, just to name but a few. And that's something that you know, we are, you know, is a growing market for us. We also have what I would class as our miscellaneous market where we would produce product for the likes of uh, teddy bear fabric uh, or the likes of uh, shoes so the fabric in this shoe 
we produced, this is British wool, and we produced the fabric that, that was then made into the shoe. And we do uh, uh, another product that we've just started, which is to produce wool rope. Uh, but we can talk about that later. That's a lot to talk about and cover, <laughs> yeah. Okay, now like I said, um, Laxton's was founded in 1907 and the ups and downs of your family's business really mirror the story of the British wool industry over the last 100 years or so. Yep. So in that time frame, can you just tell us how the company has evolved and how you've managed to diversify and survive? So in 1907... Uh, my great-grandfather, George Laxton and Gordon Holmes, set up uh, the business spinning wool and mohair. Uh, they were the first ones to produce the lightweight mohair suiting in the world, where they twisted cotton and mohair. They wove it in collaboration with the local weaver and then dissolved away the cotton, which was, um, you know, really started to help with the business. The company went through the Great Depression, two world wars. Uh, what were they doing in the wars? So uh, in the Second World War, they were producing uh, wool yarns for uh, knitwear into jumpers for the army. And the, uh, the workforce over the Second World War changed from it was predominantly men pre-war and uh, during the war, the, um, it became predominantly ladies. Uh, a lot of the men signed up to fight and so to keep it going, we had yeah. to, to bring the ladies in and it's remained like that ever since. Uh, so my grandfather was the first uh, UK salesman to go back into Germany after the war. Um, not as many customers left, uh, but, you know, he still managed to uh, start selling again. Business started to grow. 70s arrived. We diversified into Hanneting, which was a booming industry that, uh, then. And it was it grew because Hanneting... At that time, it was cheaper to buy hand knitting yarn and knit the garments than it was actually to buy a pre-made garment yes. on the shelf. Yes, which I'm sure is strange to hear now, but yes. that's why <laughs> hand knitting in the 70s just took off. Uh, so the 1780s were boom years uh, for the UK textile industry. We went from strength to strength. Had three spinning factories, a dye house, and at our peak, uh, over 600 people. So uh, I joined uh, straight from university in 92. And you were 21? 21, yeah. And wanted to work somewhere else first, another, another textile factory, but because of the name and the fact that they knew that I would leave and take my experience elsewhere, that and, wasn't And bring possible. it back home. Yeah, yeah. That, they, that, that, that was a bit of a no-no at the time. So I came straight into the uh, business. Which and at the time, when you started, there was about 150 spinning mills around this area, wasn't there? At, at That's least, a lot. at yeah. least, yes. Within yeah. probably a 20-mile uh, 20, 20 radius. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of uh, spinning companies. So I probably joined at what was the worst time to get involved with, in, in hindsight. The UK brands were looking abroad, were starting to produce... Um, further afield outside of the UK, Europe and over the, the next seven years there was a big decline in the whole industry. Companies were, were going out of business daily mm -hmm. and it was a very difficult time. I took over in 96, mm -hmm. so only four years in. Uh, had to do a lot of learning on the hoof. It was all very new, uh, not what university really geared me for. Uh, so, and the business was declining. That's a yeah. lot to take on your shoulders in your 20s. Yeah, very rapidly declining. And uh, we had to make sure that we did it in an organised fashion so we could still continue to trade, which we did until 2001. And at that point, I, I felt it, the, it was appropriate to close and so we could do it properly without... Uh, being able to walk away, pay everybody as they should be paid. So not going bankrupt. Correct. Um, and also for my, my father and Ian Crawford, his partner, to be able to walk away with their heads held high. Yeah. You know, it was a really difficult time for them. So I... That was a lot of pressure for you too. I mean, you, you had four generations of business on your shoulders to make that decision. Uh, yes, it was, but I, I'm quite pragmatic 
I will look at it and think, right, okay, I, I'm, I, I won't, I'll try and not let the emotion get in the way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably easy when I was younger. Uh, probably not quite so easy now, but it was then. Uh, and so that was a really difficult time for, um, you know, both families. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of re-looked and thought, well, what am I going to do? I felt I had more to give still in textiles because I'd only been in it for a short period of time. And I decided that, yeah, I'll, I'll set up, I'll carry on. Mm -hmm. uh, so three of us set, set about, uh, we, I, I set a new office up. Uh, we had no product, no customers. Uh, so we had to design product. We decided to move our product um, away from the mass market. Uh, so high, higher value raw materials, all natural fiber, predominantly wool based still. And redesign find new customers but we were going to produce it abroad mainland Europe France Spain Italy so we did that for seven years as we got closer to 2008 we were struggling with supply out of Europe uh, too many times we would ring up the suppliers and said you know when's the delivery coming and they would say oh we're closing uh, well, okay so when do you reopen oh we're not so I'd have to jump on a plane, get a transport company, get straight to the manufacturer, get all my raw materials out there before I couldn't, mm -hmm. uh, find a new manufacturer. That's pretty stressful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It <laughs> happened too many times and I would literally have to drop everything and get on a plane from Leeds Bradford. So I started to take stock of it and thought, what are we doing? And why are we doing that? We, I, I know how to manufacture. I've done it before. Why don't we do that? Most people I spoke to thought I was crazy, you know. People so most still, your your colleagues, the so people in the know, thought you were yeah, crazy. Yeah, and and customers as well. Yeah, uh, you know, people are still moving out of the country. Why are you wanting to do and come the other way and bring it back? So it did slow me down, but I was confident in our ability to do it and and get the quality back, get the service uh, back to where it was. And if we were going to do it in this country, we needed to be the best in the world at what we did. That mm -hmm. was the kind of bar. Yeah. So I set about buying machines around Europe. Uh, first machine I bought, I flew into Barcelona Airport, was picked up by this agent I'd never met before. He drove me four hours into the mountains. Uh, no idea where I was going. And the machine that I went to see hadn't run for 10 years. So I took a punt, bought it. Um, and then went around Europe buying So the did you have mechanical knowledge to be able to pull it apart uh, and put it together properly? No. Right. But Who I didn't? knew people that okay, could. Okay, you know, yeah. yeah, and I'd spoken to them in depth before I travelled. Okay. I bought all the machinery and then needed to find somewhere to put it. I thought that would be easy, but we're in the middle of the worst recession of our lifetime. Uh, a lot of commercial properties, not enough electricity, uh, any of them. Yeah. So I would have to, to get enough electricity would cost me the same as it would to buy the property itself. So that I couldn't afford to do that at the yeah. same time as buying all the kit. And uh, I found an old customer of ours who had space and electricity. So that's where mm -hmm. we went. And we spent uh, six years in that property, expanding, growing, working longer hours, buying more machinery, and we outgrew it. So we built a new state-of-the-art factory, which is where we are today, and have been here for now five years. So, and bringing our manufacturing back, you know, when I look back in, in the records, it was the first, it is the first time that it's been done for well over 50 years. And I gave up looking after that. Uh, so that's a really big achievement. Yeah, I don't tend what, to look backwards. A, <laughs> probably a good thing. <laughs> so your colleagues, they, they must be... Uh, Holding their, <laughs> shutting their mouths now, no, not laughing yeah, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> not many of them have spoken to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can see we have a lot of yarn here in front of us and um, we've taken a, a, a few of the different types that um, Laxton Yarns produce because each yarn range has been produced for a different purpose and I would like you now to go through the story of the behind each of the yarn ranges and... Show off. Show off your vast <laughs> technical knowledge for our very educated audience. Okay. The first product that uh, I'll talk about is 
uh, one we've done with Rowan Yarns for hand knitting. And uh, the end product is called Pebble Island. And the reason for that is because the raw material, the wool, actually comes from an island in the Falklands called Pebble Island. And uh, we looked at actually buying the island when it was for sale uh, a few I know. years ago. You tell me I was so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> which would get us a farm, which would get us traceability yeah. and transparency and so on. Uh, but I spoke to the farmer who lived on the island and we decided best for him to buy the island mm -hmm. and we would basically buy the wool from him, which is their main source of income. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Uh, the idea behind the product for Rowan was they wanted something that was transparent and traceable. Mm -hmm. and of a high quality. Mm. Falkland wool is some of the best wool in the world. It's very it's white. It's merino? Uh, it's from, mainly from a Corridale okay. breed. Um, but it's fine micron, around 21 micron, and very white, very long, and makes for a very, very high quality uh, um, soft yarn. Yeah, it is very soft. Yeah. yeah. And it's very white compared to, you know, if you look at that compared to... Yes. You know, that's a British wool uh, and it is extremely white. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the the remit from Rowan was transparent traceability. Pebble Island was perfect. There's, you know, there's a lot about the island. There's a penguin sanctuary on it. Um, you know, there's one farmer. That's the only people that live on it. It's a great story. And so... We pulled all that together. So we bring the fiber, greasy fiber, from Stanley in the Falklands Islands. We ship it to Bradford, and then we process it everything uh, in the UK, all within uh, five miles of here. So this is a, um, a, a two-fold yarn. Mm -hmm. Two-fold is two ply. Two ply, yes. Right. Um, and we designed the spinning twist and the folding twist around uh, getting the most out of the wool. So we're buying. A high value wool, we mm -hmm. want to get the most out of it. So there's a balance between getting the twist too high, at which point it will feel won't feel as soft, mm -hmm. and if it's too low, it'll, it'll peel. peel. And we don't like peeling. No, and so getting that balance between the two, mm -hmm. and then the twist, the, the folding twist really is governed by the spinning twist. Okay. So we start with the spinning twist, and then um, we'll get to that. And that again is down to what they want out of the product. So. Um, they generally tended to leave that to us to say, right, what's the best? What we, how are we going to get the best out of the fibre? Okay, and that's where yeah. our skills come. We don't design around a yarn. We design around fibre. And so the, the, every fibre has different characteristics. And we have to get those characteristics out in the yarn. And that is where the specification of the spinning and the twisting all come in. Yeah. And that is a big dip. We don't take a standard wool and just make... 50 yeah. different yarns. Yeah. We take a particular type of wool to do a particular purpose and there's no point spending a lot of money on fork and wool and putting too high a twist in it. Of course not. No. So yeah. you'll get the you whiteness but you won't get yeah. the softness. Yeah. Um, and the same with some of the British wools which is where we come on to uh, the Bialaxton's product which is uh, sheep soft. So we wanted to create a product and this product goes into hand knitting mm -hmm. but it also goes into uh, machine knitting okay right uh, same plies no 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 this is uh the um vial accidents is either two ply which is two ends which is a four ply yarn mm -hmm. weight knitting weight and we do an aran okay so a fingering weight but it's it's got two plies in yes. it. yes right uh, and then an aran weight and that has got uh, five ends Five plies. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So five plies. Yeah. Uh, five so plies. that's five, which gives us an iron weight. Right. Uh, as far as hand knitting yeah. concerned. But the yarn, the base of it is exactly the same. Okay. So we've taken, what we had to do is we wanted to get away from traditional British wool mm -hmm. being people thinking it was iron weight, uh, uh, knitwear, coarse, mm -hmm. yeah. fisherman's jumper, uh, very robust. We wanted to get a much better handle. So we selected fibres to enable that. And so after various multiple different uh, trials, we came up with utilising Blueface Leicester. Okay, yeah. Uh, which for which me is, is very the, soft. Yeah, and for me it's the cashmere of wool and yeah. commercially and Massam. Okay. And Massam is a breed that you can get in white, a mid-brown and a dark brown. And I gather from this heathered tones here, you've got it in a... 
not in white. Is that right? Correct. So, yeah. the, so, so this for so that for example is uh, one of the colours that we do. Uh, we take a dark brown massum, mm -hmm. which is that fibre, and we put it with a fibre dyed blue face Leicester. So we dye the fibre rather than the yarn. Okay, I was going to ask you that actually earlier. Do you only dye in hanks or do you dye fibre as well? We do both. Yeah. We dye it in fibre and by dyeing it in fibre we get this type of uh, effect in shade, mm -hmm. the mixture shades. Um, so this has got this in it yep. and the dyed and the, you know, the light green yep. dyed of, of, here. Of the, yep. of the, and so this is another one here that is the same, uh, but this is one of the natural colours. So we've got undyed blue face, but with, in this case, it's a lighter brown, massive, yeah. st same yeah. breed, yeah. just a lighter brown, which gives us different colours. Now tell me the, the characteristics of Massam normally. Is it, um, what's the micron range or? So Massam is more around 32, 33 micron and has quite a high crimp. Yeah, okay, so um, it gives you bounce. Yeah, it gives you bounce. Blue face Leicester is about 26, 27 micron. And it's more silky, isn't it? Yeah, and it's got a sheen to it. Yeah. It's a. It, it's not a lustrous fibre, but it has a sheen, okay. which a lot of the others don't. So, so putting the, them together gives yeah. you... It gives us softness. Yeah. And uh, it gives us... The massum gives us strength for machine knitting. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the average micron and blend gives us the, the bounce that you get in the fibre there. And so we managed to design a yarn that gives us uh, the softness that we want, which is actually not what people perceive. They don't think it is British wool because it does handle very well. And it gives us the strength, the massum gives us the strength uh, yeah. and the colour and the natural colour in there to to create it. And it's it, this has been machine knit into um, garments and again, as I say, Bilaxton is on the hand knitting side. I really like the heathered colours. They're beautiful. Yeah, and then there's this colour range of 16 that we do. Um, and because it's the same base, it's the same single worsted spun yarn yeah. that we will put into machine knitting. We do it into... We, we twist it tighter into weaving. Right. And then we ply it together for hand knitting. Okay. And we process the hand knitting... We steam it. Yes. Um, we live steam the hand knitting yarn, but we don't the machine knit because the garment is steamed. Okay. And also getting back to the massum, it's, been, it's a little bit coarser, but worsted spinning actually means you can use coarser yarns without them um, being so prickly too. Is that correct? Yes. If you took massum, mm. and so if you took the, the, the brown massum, for example, this mid-brown uh, shade, and you put that into a woolen root, and we mm. put that down to the worsted root and we spun the same count of yarn um, and plied it the same, the worsted spun root would feel a lot softer. Yeah. Uh, on a like for like basis. Yeah. Um, but again, we've designed the, the uh, technical spec of the yarn, so the spinning um, twist that we put in, to get the most out of the massum because that feels soft. Mm. If I put a lot of twist in it, it would suddenly feel very coarse. Yeah. And yeah. so we've got the balance then of the uh, of the twist with the balance of the two fibres. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. that's how we manage to to get such a a, a great handle there. Okay. So this yes. is interesting. Tell us yeah, about this so one. One of the things that we've we manufacture makes waste. Our processing uh, fibre. There's vacuums on all the machines, so there's loose fibre and we remove that loose fibre so it's out of the atmosphere and we suck it away into vacuum. Uh, historically, we, we, we either have to give it away or, or sell it um, for not a lot of money and it goes into compost or it might go into um, dog bedding or something like okay, that. Okay, yeah. But we felt that actually what we wanted to do is try and get to the point where we made no waste. So what could we do? We have got to take that, which is a tangled mess, and try and reconstitute that back into fibre to then put into our product. Is this the tangled mess? No. Okay. So the tangled mess, this is what comes, that what is what we make from the tangled mess. So oh, this, right. Yeah. So this is all the fibre waste that we make mm -hmm. reconstituted back into fibre. So in here, there'll be mohair, wool, 
silk, alpaca. It's whatever's going through the factory at the time. We'll put a batch together and we'll reconstitute. Now, that took us about a year to get to the point where we could actually do that. To have the technology and the know-how yes, to do it. to, to right. get it, because you break fibre, and we're yeah. trying to not break fibre. Okay. So we managed that. Yeah. So the next step was to, right, okay, well, we could blend that now with anything. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to take it a step further. We make threads and thread waste, which is that. So what we did, so this happens to be our customers' thread waste. Okay. So they may dye yarn, or their customers may have bits left over. Yeah. And what we get them to do is to chop it into small pieces like you see here. And basically what we do is we take this, we take our recycled waste and we put it with virgin fibre, 50% virgin fibre. Um, and typically what is that? Could that be... That's forkland wool. Okay, right. So we use a very good quality wool. Right. Uh, yeah. Because... This, it's a high-end product, yes. so we have to get the yeah. handle. So that brings us handle. Yeah. That's got natural fibre in it. Yeah. And then this is thread waste. And we put all those together. Again, it's taken a long time to be able to... Figure it, that out. <laughs> because it's exactly what you shouldn't do with right. worsted spinning. This goes against every principle of worsted spinning. Right. Don't put thread in it and don't put broken fibre in. Right. Because you'll, you'll end up with slubs, thin places... And it will break. Okay, so how did you so, make well, it work? It, as I say, we've we 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 basically put these into a a, a a big hopper, and with air blow it all around into fiber, so it, it all mixes together, and we put it through a, a, a card, and uh, we basically get an intermingled blend out of it, and we have to process it here uh, more than three times what we would normally to get it parallel uh, oh, okay. as parallel as we right. can into fibre yeah. into into form like this yeah. that we can then spin and spinning it again is complex because it's doing everything that we shouldn't be doing right uh, <laughs> is that exciting for you? Uh, yes it, well it's exciting when we get it right <laughs> not so much when we get it wrong no and so what you can see here is you can see all the threads mm -hmm. throughout this uh, uh, yeah. I'll just hold it like this so they can there you see. Go. Yep. Um, and then we, what, once we've got it onto a spinning tube, yep. we can then take it, twist it, ply it, um, and produce. Ultimately, that is the, the yarn that we produce uh, from this product, which is a okay. two ply yarn. And that's a, a hand knitting yarn? Yes. So if people want to buy this, what do you call this yarn, this yarn so range? This, this is. This particular yarn is through a company called Hedgehog. Okay. And um, because a lot of what we do is private label, mm -hmm. uh, and we've designed this product for them. Okay, um, lovely. And it's th these are their threads. Yes. And they send them to us, and, and then we work our magic on it and send yarn back. Excellent. Okay, now we've got to hear about this yes. spring yarn, which so has got an interesting story. It has it. got an interesting story. So this yarn here is... so. The basis of, the, of why we developed this is, at the moment, seaweed is, is grown and harvested around the coast of the UK, but it's grown on polypropylene rope, mm. and that releases plastics into, into the, the ocean, ocean yeah. and obviously everybody's aware of, of why that's not yes. ideal. Yeah. So what we've uh, been working very closely with uh, a number of people to create a wool product that actually can can be put together as a rope. So, you know, there might be uh, 30 or 40 of these ends going to make a very thick rope, which will then be put into the ocean for seaweed to grow on. And obviously it will biodegrade. And therefore, as a result of that, it's a lot better on the environment. Now, How long will it last? Well, we're at pilot stage. Right. <laughs> okay. So I can't answer that. <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's the big question. The rope has only just been made. Mm-hmm. Um, and is going down, it'll be going to a farm in Cornwall uh, for them to pilot, test it, see how that works. We might have to go back to the drawing board and tweak how it. How exciting. Okay, so very quickly, what kind of fleece is in there? And Well, this is a combination of uh, long wool, mm -hmm. um, which we need for the strength, obviously mm -hmm. from a rope point of view yep. and when it gets wet and so on. And it's all British. Is it's it? all British wool. Yep. yep. So the idea is we can make the whole product 
out of uh, in the UK, uh, rope it in the UK, do it, the whole thing here, and then uh, the farms can then access it all from, and it's a British product, all the way from farm all the way through to the finished product. So yeah. it is, uh, it's exciting to see. We don't know the outcome yet. <laughs> when do you think it'll be finished? Um, is there a, a, a project managing date, cut off line? Yeah, the end of the year. Right. But they've got to do the sea trials. Okay. Yeah. So it's been made into rope already. Yeah. Uh, that's then got to go into the sea, tri- sea trials. So hopefully by uh, the latter part of this year, we should have an idea of whether it's been successful or if it hasn't, why not? And then we mm-hmm. can go back to the drawing board to find out, right, do we need to change the fibre? Do we need to change the spec of the product, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and you've obviously put a ton of twist into that. Uh, yes, there is a lot of twist. <laughs> We're not so much bothered about how this handles. Okay, and you're not, you're not worried about the S and the Z twists? Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, that, I mean, you know, once you make these big, thick ropes, it's, it, it doesn't become that relevant. Yeah, okay, that's great. Now, um, Prince Charles launched the Campaign for Wool in the UK back in 2010, and you were present at the very first meeting with Prince Charles, so we want to hear all about that first meeting. Yeah. And also, uh, how successful you think the campaign's been so okay. far? So, yes, Prince Charles uh, became patron of uh, a campaign for wool in, in January 2010 was the first meeting. Um, I was lucky enough to be um, asked down basically because we just put new manufacturing in and it was wool based, so it was quite uh, opportune time. So that first meeting was really the second month of our operation as a manufacturer. So we went down to a barn in Cambridge okay. where the first meeting was, and we drove down and obviously quite excited to be thinking, you know, Prince Charles, is, we're going to meet Prince Charles and hear what his plans are for yeah. uh, uh, for wool. Yeah. Um, so we arrived and we were, we sat down and, and Prince Charles stood up to, to speak and wrapped in a very lovely wool, long winter wool coat. coat. <laughs> and and you I was in your... January. We were in suits, no, no <laughs> coats, that freezing it was. <laughs> and and by the time we, we could hardly talk by the time we came out, we were it all so lock. cold. Yeah, everything was cold. <laughs> but, you know, very exciting time. Yeah. Uh, um, the, that's, you know, a long time ago now. The, a lot has happened mm-hmm. and it's been, you know, having Prince Charles as the patron has been really, really good for the wool industry. Mm-hmm. Um, he's championed... Um, the whole industry, not just one one sector, and this is worldwide. Mm-hmm. So, you know, New Zealand wool, Australian wool, mm-hmm. British wool, mm-hmm. uh, Norwegian wool, all of it, it's about, it's a global thing. Okay, and actually recently you've started another collaboration with the Wool Keepers, which will yep. significantly support the British sheep farmers and give full traceability to the end consumer. Yep. So talk about that project. Okay, so that there is the, um, the fabric that we've produced from, uh, the wool keepers uh, fiber. Mm-hmm. One of the, the issues in the UK is the farmers, as people who have heard in press, uh, aren't really getting uh, what we would call a fair price for their wool. Mm. Some of them are finding it difficult to get it delivered. Some are finding it um, that then they're definitely not covering the cost of the shearing. So we wanted to try and see if we could um, change that. So Woolkeepers is um, a, a corporation that's set up to bring farmers on board. So the farmers have to sign up. They've got this welfare, uh, animal welfare involved. But the main idea is to get a fair price to the farmer for the wool that they are, are growing as a byproduct. Mm-hmm. And um, that is, is important, but also to be able to pay them there and then because the wool board, the way that the structure is at the moment, they don't necessarily get paid straight away. Yeah, uh, They've got all the costs of the shearing to cover um, uh, and, and it does become a challenge. So in the end, the consumer can almost see where their garment, what farm the garments come from, is that yeah, right? The, the idea is is that there will be a QR code on all, any product that we make using the wool keeper's wool. Mm-hmm. That QR code will tell the consumer what farms the wool has come from Mm-hmm. and where it's being produced through the country and at, at what location to get to, to the product that they are uh, purchasing. So it's completely transparent and traceable all the way back to the farm. 
and they can yeah. speak to the farmer if they wanted yeah because we're giving all the details of the farms where the wool has come from yeah uh, and we get into a position where they've got the confidence that it is what it says yeah that's that's really exciting and it's a lot more interesting for the consumer to 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 get involved or, or feel connected with yeah because everything that they'll be purchasing that is through this route they can have the confidence that mm. the farmer is getting a fair price for his wool mm. and at the moment not all and that is not happening yeah i mean the uk is a bit different because there's thirty five thousand farms in the uk yeah and they're all very small um, on average so there's a there's a huge number of farms and so this is going to take a while but we need to get the consumers behind it because that's how we can get the fair price to the farmers yeah, yeah. Um, and it's transparent well that's very exciting and I'm sure the the viewers will be excited about that as well we have to wrap the interview up but before we end it I, I'm very impressed just the whole hearing the whole story of the mill and thank you this you know right back from your great grandparents but then when you came on board in, in your early 20s and then having to totally rethink and, and um, reinvent yeah. the future and I, I keep thinking to do that you would have to be always looking forward always anticipating challenges and problems that might be able to come up and then still stay flexible so that you can move and jump to those situations mm -hmm. very quickly to me that is just so exhausting so <laughs> I would like to know how what drives you to keep doing this because I'm sure at times you would have found that terribly stress, stressful. Yeah. So what does it mean to you to innovate and how do you keep doing it without getting utterly exhausted? Yeah, I think it, it, it does get tiring. Um, I, I, you know, I think with the, the history that I had with, you know, joining in 92 and seeing... Um, how devastated the industry was then, that is a big driver for me to, to uh, you know, no one wants to go there again. Yeah. Um, and that's enough to keep you, you know, on track. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you live something for that amount of time and, you know, it, it motivates, it certainly motivates me to make sure that we are constantly... Uh, reinventing we're constantly developing we're always looking for new areas to keep the momentum of the business going and you know there's infrastructure issues in the UK with the textile industry well let's get into those let's have a look at those let's see what we can do you know we've we, we've we set the spinning up we then had an issue with our finishing so we invested in the finishing we then had an issue with our dyeing We've invested in the dying. But does it excite you to do that? Like, yeah. are you excited by these challenges? Because some uh, yes. people would feel completely overwhelmed and want to just close the doors. Yeah, I, I, I am excited by it and I do thrive on, on change and, and I thrive on trying to be the best at what we do. And so that's a motivating that's thing. That's the motivator for me. I, I, I want Laxton's to be the best at what it does and it has to constantly adapt to if you stay still and continue if we produce the same products as we produced last year we're going backwards mm. um, I don't find it daunting um, you know it does it, it definitely excites me does that part of uh, the business and we are wanting to be the best at what what, what uh, you know what we do and that's a high bar good on you <laughs> <laughs> well it's been a real pleasure to have you on fruity knitting so thank you so thank much thank you I've enjoyed it Good. Let's say goodbye to the viewers. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.